In this lesson, I will finally teach you what the graph of both sine and cosine functions look like. We'll start by graphing f at x equals sine x. Now it's worth noting that the input of a trig function, which we're calling x, is an angle. So on our x-axis, these are all angles, and the y-axis is the sine ratio of those angles. And then we need to pick a bunch of angles that we're going to get sine ratios for so that we can plot a bunch of points on this graph and see what the sine function looks like. I've chosen those angles here, and I've chosen those strategically because they're going to give us a good picture of what the shape of this sine function looks like, and it'll also reveal to us that this sine function is actually a periodic function with a pattern of y values that repeats over and over and over again. And these x values will actually give us one cycle of this periodic function. Now to calculate these y values for each of these angles, I need to find the sine ratio of each of those angles, and we can do that using special triangles, the unit circle, or a calculator if you want to. Just make sure your calculator is in degree mode. So actually below this graph, let me remind you of these tools. In the last unit, we learned about the special triangles. We learned about the isosceles special triangle, which has angles of 45 and 45, and side lengths of 1, 1, and root 2. We also learned about the half equilateral special triangle, which has angles of 60, 30, and side lengths of 2, 1, and root 3. And then I'll actually make these a bit smaller so I have room to draw the unit circle. Remember the unit circle is a circle with a radius of 1 that's centered at the origin. Because it has a radius of 1, I could label 4 points. And if we have a terminal arm that rotates around this unit circle, wherever it intersects this unit circle at some x, y point, I could actually rewrite that point as cosine and sine ratios for this angle of rotation. And to help you visualize that, if I draw this right triangle connected down to the x-axis, I could label this side of it x and this side of it y. And because the radius of the circle is 1, I'll label that side of the triangle 1. And then using SOHCAHTOA, I know that sine of the angle would equal y divided by 1. So sine of theta is equal to y. Cos of theta would equal adjacent over hypotenuse x over 1, which means cos of theta equals x. And tan of theta would be equal to opposite over adjacent, which is y over x. So notice cosine of the angle of rotation is equal to x. So this x coordinate of where it intersects the unit circle is equal to the cosine ratio of the angle and the y coordinate is equal to the sine ratio of the angle. So I could replace that x, y point with cos theta sine theta. So these y coordinates that are on the unit circle all correspond to the sine ratios of each of these angles of rotation. And all the x coordinates correspond to the cosine ratio of each of these angles. And because of this relationship between sine, cos, and tan and the x and y coordinates of the unit circle, I know that in this quadrant, quadrant number one, x and y coordinates are positive, meaning all three of these ratios would be positive. So often this is called the all quadrant. In this quadrant, y coordinates are positive, but x coordinates are negative, meaning the sine ratio would be positive, but cos and tan would be negative. So this is called the sine quadrant because only sine is positive in that quadrant. And then in this quadrant, quadrant number three, both x and y coordinates are negative, making sine and cos negative, but tan would be a negative over a negative, which is positive. So in this quadrant, only tan would be positive. And in this quadrant, quadrant number four, x coordinates are positive, so cos would be positive, but y coordinates are negative, so sine would be negative, making cosine the only positive ratio in that quadrant. And a lot of people memorize this acronym, C-A-S-T, and call it the CAST rule to help you remember which ratios are positive in each quadrant. So using all of these tools, let's find the sine ratios for each of these angles. We won't use your calculator. Starting with sine of zero. Well, if a terminal arm rotates zero degrees, it's going to intersect the unit circle at this point, which has a y coordinate of zero, meaning the sine ratio of zero is going to be zero. So I can plot my first point on my graph at the point zero, zero. And then sine of 30, in my special triangle is 30 degrees, sine is opposite over hypotenuse, so sine of 30 is equal to a half. My next point is at 30 degrees, 0.5. And then sine of 60, from 60 degrees opposite over hypotenuse is root 3 over 2. 
So sine of 60 is root three over two, but to graph it, we'd probably want the approximate value of root three over two, which is about 0 0.87. So I can plot the point 60, 0 0.87, which is about right here. And then 90 degrees, well, if I rotate 90 degrees, I would intersect the unit circle right here at a point whose y coordinate is one, which means the sine ratio for 90 degrees has to be equal to one. So I can plot the point at 90, one. So these first few angles have rotated us through the first quadrant. Let me actually draw another Cartesian grid. We've gone from zero to 90 degrees. Now we're going to go through quadrant number two, and we're going to find the sine ratio for 120. Rotating 120 degrees from the positive x-axis, so 120 counterclockwise, would bring me to this red terminal arm, which has a reference angle of 60. Remember, reference angle is the angle between the terminal arm and the closest x-axis. So the angle between 180 and 120 is 60. So finding sine of 120 is actually going to be equal to finding the sine of 60, because in this quadrant, the sine ratio stays positive. So sine of 120 and sine of 60 are equal to each other. And if I drew a principal angle of 60, you would see that rotating 60 degrees or 120 degrees brings you to a point on the unit circle that has the same y coordinate, which is why their sine ratios are equal to each other. So sine of 120 is going to be equal to sine of 60, which is 0.87. So I can plot the point at 120, 0 0.87, which is about right here. And then to find sine of 150, once again, if we rotate 150, that's gonna bring me to about here with a reference angle of 30. So sine of 50 is going to be equal to sine of 30. And in my table, I already know sine of 30 is 0.5. And then sine of 180, well, if I rotate 180 degrees, I would intersect the unit circle right here at this point, which has a Y coordinate of zero. So the sine ratio of 180 is going to be equal to zero. Notice between zero and 180 degrees, all of the sine ratios were positive. And that's because we've rotated through quadrant one and quadrant two. Now we're going to be going through quadrant three and four, where the y coordinates on the unit circle are negative. So the sine ratios in these quadrants between 180 and 360 are going to be negative. But we're going to cycle through those same y values that we did in quadrant one and two, but they're going to be negative. So when I find the sine ratio for 210, if I rotate 210 degrees, that will bring me 30 degrees past 180. So to find sine of 210, I can instead do sine of 30, but because in this quadrant only tan is positive, I would have to make my sine ratio negative. So sine of 210 is equal to the negative of sine 30. I know sine 30 is a half, so sine of 210 is going to be negative a half. And then 240, if I rotate 240, I go past 180 by 60 degrees. So sine of 240 is going to be equal to the negative of sine of the reference angle, negative sine 60. And sine of 60 is 0.87, so sine of 240 is negative 0.87. And then sine of 270, if I rotate 270, I would intersect the unit circle at this point, which is a y coordinate of negative one. So sine of 270 is equal to negative one. And then 300 degrees, that brings us into quadrant number four. If I rotate 300, that brings me to here, which is 60 degrees before going a full 360. Notice actually 240 and 300 both have the same reference angle, which means the Y coordinates of these points are the same, which means their sine ratios are the same. So sine of 240 and sine of 300 are going to be equal to each other. They're both negative 0 0.87. And 330, if I rotate 330, that brings me just 30 degrees short of doing a full 360 degrees. So sine of 330 is going to be equal to the negative of sine of 30, because in this quadrant, the y coordinate of that point is negative, and the cast rule also tells me that only cos is positive in this quadrant. So sine of 330 is equal to the negative of sine 30, which means it's gonna be negative 0.5. And then lastly, 360 degrees, if I rotate 360, that's coterminal with zero degrees. So sine of 360 and sine of zero are both the same. They're both equal to this y coordinate of zero. So if I connect all of these points, you can see the general shape of this sine function, which is a curved periodic function. It's going to repeat this pattern of y values over and over and over again. And that's because this terminal arm, as it rotates around and around and around this unit circle, so as the angle goes to infinity, 
it's just going to cycle through going through the same pattern of y values of where it intersects this unit circle, which is going to form this cycle of the function. That pattern of y values will just keep repeating. And in fact, we can graph a cycle of this in the negative direction over here. So you can just use your patterning to plot more points. Or what I'm going to do, I'm just going to duplicate this section and basically copy and paste it right there. And that's what another cycle of this will look like. I'll change the color of this cycle so you can see the difference between those cycles. Notice it's the exact same pattern of y values. And we want to put arrows on both sides of this function to show that this is a continuous function. It actually has an infinite domain. It's going to continue forever to the left and to the right. And one more thing I want to show you before we write down some properties of this is I want to make sure you understand the connection between this unit circle and the graph of sine. As I rotate this terminal arm around the unit circle, I also have this software plotting the graph of sine. And what I want you to pay attention to is the y coordinate of where the terminal arm intersects the unit circle and how that matches exactly with the sine ratio. It matches exactly with the y coordinate of the sine function. So as I rotate around, notice at an x value or an angle of 30, it intersects the unit circle 0.5 above the x-axis, which is why the sine ratio for 30 degrees is also 0.5. So there's an exact correlation between the y coordinate of where it intersects the unit circle and of the sine ratio. That's why this function goes as high as one and then comes back down to negative one and then finishes back at a y coordinate of zero. So hopefully that demonstration has helped you. And now what we're going to do is also graph a cosine function. We're going to graph f at x equals cos x. Now we're going to use the exact same angles, but our y axis this time is the cosine ratio for each of those angles. Now I'm not going to spend as much time doing these calculations. Remember, you could just do cosine on your calculator at each of those angles. It'll give you the ratio. Or we could use each of these tools that I wrote here to find all the cos ratios. But what I think I'm going to do is I'm just going to give you the values. Since for sine, I showed you how we could get each individual one. For cosine, I'll just give you the values. You probably recognize all of these values from the graph of sine. They just seem to be in different positions. And if we plot all of these points, you'll see what the graph of cosine looks like. If I connect all of these points, I get one cycle of the cosine function. And if I continue this pattern of y values, but I'm going to continue it going in the negative direction, I'll get another cycle of this function. And make sure to put arrows on each end of this function. And notice that this cosine function, which I drew two cycles of, one in red, one in blue, it looks exactly like the sine function. Let me go back up to the sine function so you can see except it seems to have been shifted. If I took this sine function and shifted it 90 degrees to the left, it would line up exactly with this cosine function. So these sine and cosine functions can actually be used to represent a group of functions called sinusoidal functions. If you have a sinusoidal function that makes this wave shape, you could use either a sine or a cosine function to model the relationship between the variables. The only difference between using a sine or a cosine function would be the horizontal shift value that you would use in your equation. And let me actually show you that in Desmos. I've got my cosine function in blue and my sine function in red. But notice if I shifted that red sine function 90 units to the left, notice that it would match up exactly with the cosine function. Meaning I could use a sine or a cosine function to describe any wave that looks like this. And now let's actually state some properties of these sine and cosine functions. Let's state their domain, range, period, and amplitude. Well, domain, because these functions extend forever to the left and right, we say it has an infinite domain. X, the angle, could be any real number. You can do sine or cosine of any real number and get an answer. The range, however, if we look at how high or low these functions go, they don't go infinitely high and low. Sine and cos ratios have a max of one and a min of negative one. They're always between negative one and one, including negative one and one. So for the range, we would say that y can be any real number, given that it's between or equal to negative one and one. And the period of these functions, the horizontal length of one cycle, notice that the horizontal length, well, if this is the start 
and this is the end of that blue cycle, the horizontal length of that is the period. And since the cycle starts at zero degrees and finishes at 360, we know the period is 360 degrees. And amplitude is half the distance between max and min. Well, we would start by finding the full distance between the max and the min by looking at a maximum point and a minimum point and finding the difference in their y values. Well, the y value of the max is one and the y value of the min is negative one. So I'll start by finding the difference in those two, one minus negative one, that's the full distance between max and min, which is two, but amplitude is half of that, two divided by two is one. Sine and cosine functions have an amplitude of one. Now, this period and amplitude can be changed if we apply some transformations to sine and cos functions. For example, to a sine function, we can apply the parameters a and c to cause vertical transformations, and k and d can cause horizontal transformations. Let me remind you of those in Desmos quickly. So here's my sine function in red, which has an amplitude of one, but if I change the a value, that can vertically stretch or compress the function, which is going to affect its amplitude. And in fact, the amplitude is just equal to the absolute value of the a value. If a goes up to two, if I vertically stretch it by two, half the distance between the max and the min is now two. And same if a is negative two. It's vertically reflected, but the amplitude is still two. I'll put the amplitude back to one. And now let's look at the k value. I've highlighted one cycle of this function in purple. Let me actually make it a bit bigger so you can see it better. Notice the horizontal length of that cycle is 360, but k horizontally stretches or compresses the function. So if I make k two, it actually horizontally compresses it by a factor of one over two. And the period of the function is now only 180. So if you do 360 divided by the absolute value of k, that's going to give you the new period of the function. And then d shifts this function left or right, and c shifts this function up or down. And all of those properties are summarized in this table for you. The absolute value of a is the amplitude, 360 divided by the absolute value of k is the period, d shifts it left and right, and c shifts it up and down. So let's see if we can fill out this table for this transformed sine function. So in finding the amplitude, I do the absolute value of a. So I need the absolute value of three, which is just three. And then to find the period, I do 360 divided by the absolute value of k, and k is two. So 360 over two, the function's horizontally compressed by a half, making the period of the function 180 degrees. Phase shift is whether it's shifting left or right, and that's caused by the d value. Remember the d value is always the opposite sign as what you see in the equation because d is whatever we're subtracting from the angle. We must be subtracting a negative 60 to make it look like plus 60. So because d is negative 60, that means you're going to shift left 60 degrees. And the vertical shift, that's caused by the c value, which is negative one, so the function must be moving down one unit. And now we actually want the max and min values of the function as well. Let me do a rough sketch of a sinusoidal function to help you understand what the formulas are for each of these. For any sine or cos function, the midline of the function is equivalent to c, right? Because c shifts it up or down, and the midline is usually right on the x-axis. If we shift it up or down, the midline is going to be at whatever the c value is. And remember, amplitude is half the distance between max and min. So another way of thinking of amplitude, it's the distance from the midline of the function up to the max, or the distance between the midline of the function and the minimum point. So if we're interested in what is the y coordinate of the max, we can just take the c value, add the amplitude, and we now know what the max value of the function is. So to find the max, we can do c plus amplitude. Remember, amplitude is the absolute value of a. So in this question, my c value is negative one, and then add the amplitude of three. So if I do negative one plus three, that tells me the max y value of the function is two. And then if I want the min value of the function, I can just go to the c value and subtract the amplitude and that brings me to the min. So to find the min, just do c minus the amplitude. So that'd be negative one minus three, which is negative four. So now that you know what the graphs of sine and cosine functions look like, and you've had a little introduction to transformations of sine and cos functions, make sure you go to Jensen Math and try out the practice questions that go along with this section. Jensen Math!